Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study once again tonight. We bless your name for your children, brothers and sisters who are coming regularly. And thank you for how you are revealing yourself to them, the deep truths of the word of God. We are praying, Lord, that you help those who have not been coming, that you stir them up so that they will come and join us and they will not be missing the deep revelations of your word in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that for those of us who are here together to study your word, that this word will be of benefit to every one of us in Jesus' name. Reveal your mind and your truth to us by your spirit, so that in times of trial, in times of persecution, in times of conflict and pressure, your word will be a strength within us and will be able to stand in spite of everything around in Jesus' name. Open eyes of understanding tonight that we may behold deep, wondrous things out of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study once again tonight. I appreciate those of you who are here. And I want to encourage you that you'll talk to your friends, brothers and sisters, children of God, that they need to be present with us so that these deep revelations of the word of God they will not be missing it so regularly. We're still in Revelation chapter 1. We've been looking at the revelation that God gave unto the Lord Jesus Christ and it was symbolized and signified by an angel unto John the beloved. We read in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he, shot, and he signified unto it by and his angel unto his servant John. You will see that he is coming from God above. And then it was given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it was revealed through the angel and given to John. But we are told in that verse 1 that it is to be revealed and shown unto his servants. His servants of that time, his servants of the time to come, his servants and children and ministers of the gospel until the end of the age. And eventually it tells us that it was John that bore record in verse 2 of this word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ of all things that he saw. You'll see here he combines the whole Bible. He says, number one, there is the word of God. That's the Old Testament. And there is a testimony of Jesus Christ. That is the New Testament. And actually, as he bore witness, he was bearing witness by writing and was bearing witness by preaching. If you, you know your Bible, there is a gospel according to St. John. Then there is first John, second John, and third John, in that he was bearing record. And you will see that he mentions being a witness in the gospel according to St. John. And also in first John, he mentions being a witness. In fact, he said, he's bearing record. And then he tells us in verse 3, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are reaching therein for the time is at hand already he tells us that these things must surely come to pass which means then the fulfillment is at the door but please remember a thousand years is with the lord like a day and a day like a thousand years so you shouldn't wonder then that two thousand years have passed and these things have not been fulfilled yet in their completion because the two thousand years will just be two days unto the lord and then he said it's john in verse 4, to the seven churches which are in Asia. I've already told you in the studies we have heard, there were more than seven churches in Asia Minor. But the Lord chose seven because seven is the number for perfection, fullness, and completeness. And so, the Lord was actually writing to all the churches. You see it already in verse 1. It's revealed to his servants. And then you see in the message to each of the churches, whether it's Ephesus or Smyrna or it's Pagamos or Thyatira or it's Sardis or it's Philadelphia Delphia or it's Laodicea. It says at the end of each message, it says what the Spirit says on the churches let him that has an ear let him hear. So then the message is not just for those seven churches, it's for the whole church. In the whole generation, 
until Christ will come. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and he has made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever and everybody said Amen. behold he cometh with the clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him even so amen i'm alpha and omega the beginning and the ending says the lord which is and which was and which is to come the almighty Having covered all those eight verses, we're not going into the vision itself, the vision of the glorified Christ. As you look at this vision of the glorified Christ, you start from verse 9. First of all, John introduces himself. He says, I, John, I, John, one of the twelve apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, I, John, that he is one of the people in the inner circle of the disciples of Jesus when Jesus was here on earth. I, John, yes, that same John that went to the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus was going to that mountain, he took Peter, James, and John. Yes, it's I, John, is the one that leaned on the bosom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I, John, if I will that he tarry until I come, what is that to thee, Peter? You just follow me. Here is a person that the Lord said before he dies, he will see the glory of the coming Christ. He will see the vision of the glorified Christ. He will see Christ running and he will see the people, he will see the theme, he will see the whole scene before it even comes to fulfillment. And he says, this I, John, according to the promise of the Lord that is writing this to you. But there's another thing here. I, John, I remember we went to the Lord Jesus Christ with mother. And then we said, can we sit one on this side and one on the other side? And then Jesus said, you don't know what you are asking. Will you be able to drink of a cup I drink? And will you be baptized and immersed in the suffering? I shall be immersed in, I shall be baptized with. And I remember that James and I, my brother and I, we said, yes, we can. And he said, yes, you will. You will suffer persecution, untold persecution. But it is not for me to give that seed to you. It is for whom it it is appointed. And as he remembers that, the persecution he was going through now, and the deprivation he was going through now, and the banishment to the Isle of Patmos he was going through now, he said, it's, it's me. It's exactly as the Lord has promised. I, John, who am also your brother and companion, and companion in tribulation, in persecution, in suffering, in the pressure, the oppression that came, the affliction that came, as a result of the fact that they were believing the Lord and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, it was in the isle called Patmos, that is called Patmos, for the watch of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what I read to you from verse 1 to verse 8. It's referring to the record he had born in verse 2, who bear record of the word of God part one and then of the testimony of jesus christ part two he said i've been bearing record i've been bearing witness i've been preaching the word and i've been revealing to the people around and to believers and unbelievers alike the word of the lord he said because of that i'm suffering persecution and i'm not the only one you too suffering persecution i'm a companion with you in tribulation and it's in the kingdom of god and it's for the patience of jesus christ and i'm in this are in this island of patmos just because of this word of god i bear record to and before because of the testimony of jesus christ he says i was in the spirit on the lord's day sunday came and i remember were it not for the persecution now i will be in the house of the lord but that will not hinder me i was still in the spirit of the lord on the lord's day on that day of worship and then i had behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying i am alpha and omega the first and the last and what thou seest write in a book 
and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Tatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And before we actually see what he saw, let, let's look at this study today, the great persecution that came before the great revelation. The great persecution that preceded the great revelation. As you have seen, John has introduced himself. Not only introduced himself, he introduced the circumstances preceding the vision and the revelation that he received. This John is that same disciple whom Jesus loved. He loved Jesus because Jesus loved him. And he said it already in the earlier verse, in one of the earlier verses when he said, Unto him that loved us. And because he loved us, he washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he has made us now kings and priests unto him and unto the Father. And then he says, because of that, glory be unto him. I want my life to be glorifying unto him. And I want to love him. He, he loved me many years before. He had been following the Lord now for more than 60 years. History tells us that he became a believer about the age of 25. And right now, he must be around 90 years of age. More than 65 years he had been following the Lord. And he was still loving the Lord steadfastly without compromising. At this time, it was uh, a Domitian that was uh, the Caesar, uh, that is the ruler, the emperor. If you understand the history of those people, General Titus was the one that destroyed Jerusalem, 70 AD. And John was alive at that time. Now General Titus had died. And he brought that to General Titus as Domitian. He had become the emperor and the ruler. And he was a very wicked person. Not only wicked, very notorious. And not only notorious, he was very proud. He wanted his image in every major city. And then he was the first emperor that said they shouldn't just call him Caesar of Rome. They should call him emperor. They should call him Lord and God. So the people will go before the image of Domitian and then they will kneel down. They will bend the knee and they will say our Lord and our God. But you know the Christians know only one God. The God of heaven. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and they refuse to bend the knee. That infuriated, that made him bitter and angry. And the persecution became very intense. The people that loved the Lord and that loved Jesus Christ supremely and followed him intimately, like John the Beloved, they refused to bow the knee to any other, to any other God or to the image of Domitian. That's the reason the persecution was so intense. And the persecution they give them, uh, sometimes they'll beat them. Sometimes they give them real hard, serious work to do. And you can imagine a man at the age of 90 suffering such a great persecution. This was the last surviving apostle. That is, all the other souls had died. His colleagues, the people of his age, the people that knew the Lord at the same time that he knew the Lord, they had all died. And this man remained alone. And even though he was alone, without any support, without any encouragement, without anybody to hold his hand and say, hey, let's keep on standing. He was still standing all alone. Uh, we're told that he was uh, uh, the, uh, the pastor, the bishop of the, of the church in Ephesus. By the time he was arrested, because he was teaching the people to stay firm, uncompromising to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he was banished under the reign of this wicked emperor, Domitian. But most where he was banished to was a barren, rocky, little island about 40 miles up the coast of Asia Minor. Banishment to such a remote island was a form of Roman punishment. The Christians were treated like criminals because they refused to worship the emperor as their god, as God. And being a leader of those, of those Christians, that was enough, a criminal offense, to earn him, John, very severe persecution. Such banishment was generally preceded by scourging by serious, wicked, cruel beating, marked by perpetual fetters, scanty clothing, insufficient food, and sleep on bare ground, a dark prison, and work under the lash of someone appointed by the persecutors, suffering such great persecution for his Lord. Then he saw the glorious vision, the glorious revelation, the glorious picture 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we look at these three verses today, we're considering them under three subtitles. Number one, the persecution of Christians before the revelation. The persecution, not only of John, the persecution of Christians or like before the revelation. Number two, perception of Christ through the spirit of revelation. Just seeing Christ through the spirit of revelation. Now, number three, the preeminence of Christ in the revelation. Let's come back to point one. The persecution of Christians before the revelation. In Revelation chapter one, let's look at it again in verse nine. I, John. It's like, uh, I'm surprised. I, John. In the Patmos of all places, seeing this revelation, I, John. All those of you in the city and there is easy life and you have not gone through persecution yet and you think that those of us under persecution, we are at a disadvantage. Listen to this. I, John, who also am your companion, am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and in the patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle, in the island that called Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. As we look at what John is saying, he mentions three things here about himself and about his fellow Christians. He's not only talking about himself because he talks about himself as a companion in tribulation, in trial, in suffering, in persecution, together with all the other people. He said, there are three things here. Now. Number one, your brother and your companion in tribulation. That is in persecution. Number two, your brother, your companion in the kingdom of God. He's been born again. Not only born again, sanctified and purified by the blood of the Lamb. And then filled with the Holy Ghost. He was there on the day of Pentecost. And then he was one of the people that preached and proclaimed the kingdom of God. And therefore he saw himself as a partaker of that kingdom. Not only a partaker of that kingdom, a companion, a fellow uh, companion of the other people too, the believers too, in the kingdom of God. Number three, a companion in the patience of Jesus Christ. In the patience, the perseverance of Jesus Christ. That is, wherever Jesus leads us, whatever Jesus permits, patiently, perseveringly, we go through it. And that is the commonality. That is the common thing among all those believers there. The Christians who have been severely persecuted. And the Christian leaders in particular, they receive greater pressure from the persecutors. But you see at this time now, how you receive this revelation. As we look at uh, the records of the Bible, from the beginning of the Bible, it's encouraging to learn that persecution of physical suffering does not hinder God's revelation to his faithful children. Ask your fellow brother, ask your fellow sister, when they were going through persecution, was the time the Bible became very real to them. The revelation of the word of God, the insight, the wisdom, the depth of knowledge they received during the time of persecution was so great. As that sister there, whose husband had been, you know, fiery and furious at home. And the persecution is so intense. It's at the time of that persecution, if you ask that sister, that she received great revelation in the watch of God. Ask the brother there, when that brother was going through real torture, real pressure, real persecution, it was at that time the Bible was sweet and the revelation was so deep and the glory of the Lord was so much upon his life. And if you ask yourself, after you've gone through that persecution, at that time, your prayer life was deepened. At that time, your understanding of the Bible was very real. At that time, the revelation of the word of God, you just opened the Bible like this and revelations will be coming. Interpretation will be coming. There was deep understanding of the word of God during that persecution. No, persecution doesn't draw revelation. Persecution doesn't hinder inspiration. Persecution does not hinder, does not limit the understanding of the word of God. On the other hand, it is persecution. It is suffering. It is the pressure. It is all the thing coming upon us from the world that actually drives us nearer and nearer unto the Lord. Persecution and earthly troubles do not necessarily hinder spiritual fellowship or spiritual growth. 
If you think about Moses, he wrote the Pentateuch, that is Genesis to Deuteronomy, in the wilderness while he was enduring the heavy burden of leading the rebellious Israelites. And you think about David. David was inspired to write those many psalms while he was being persecuted. He was running away from Saul. Do you think about Isaiah that saw the revelation of the Lord that spoke so much about Christ, about the coming Messiah? That Isaiah received his prophecies concerning Christ amidst troubles and persecution. Think about Ezekiel. Ezekiel was shown the visions that he wrote in his book while he was in exile. And of course, Jeremiah. He wrote that book under trials and deprivations that were almost unbearable. And Paul, the apostle, we're told, wrote his epistles, first and second epistles of Peter, just before he was crucified. We have all learned about Paul, the apostle, the revelations he had, the mystery of the kingdom that, is, that are written in the epistles of Paul. It, he got them while he was suffering persecution in loneliness and the loneliness of the prison. If you have uh, come across the book, uh, The Pilgrim's Progress by John Boyan. John Boyan was a Baptist preacher, but then he was a non-conformist. He will not compromise on what he knew uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the word of the Lord. And because of that, he was thrown in, in the prison. He spent altogether 12 years in the prison, in the Bedford jail. But you see next to the Bible, the most loved and the most read book is the pilgrim's progress it is a vision of the revelation of the triumph of the christian pilgrim in his journey from this world to the world that is to come and you see that uh, john boyan wrote he received and wrote that revelation of the pilgrim's progress while he was suffering imprisonment in that bed for jail and there were needs in his life in fact if you read the history of the life of that man real real suffering and yet next to the bible the pilgrim's progress is the best seller next to the bible you think about that that means then that there is persecution that doesn't stop the revelation of god in your life or in my life just remain with the lord you'll find that that suffering that persecution will deepen your christian life as we think about john again we're going back to john the beloved and we'll see him on the isle of the patmos he patiently endured the punishment for his loyalty to his king and his faithfulness to the word of god and the word of christ yet the wrath of the wicked only brought john nearer to god and the patmos of persecution persecuting rome suddenly became the door to the most sublime the most majestic and the most glorious communion any man ever had with heaven that's often God's way. We gain the greatest knowledge of God through the deepest suffering. Let's go back to that uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 9 again. It says in verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. Stop there for a moment. and Let's see this John in, John, in um, Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10, reading from verse 8. Revelation 10, verse 8, And the voice which I heard heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go, and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. This is John again. You see the personal pronoun, I, I, I. It's me. It's me, John. I got this revelation from the Lord, and the book had been written. The revelation you find in that book. And then I got it from that angel, and I ate it up. And it says, and it said unto me, take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be, it shall be in thy mouth as sweet as honey. What he's saying is, as you have seen it, you'll be enjoying it. As you have seen it, it will be wonderful to you. Even the privilege, the mystery that the Lord is revealing to you, the joy of it, the sweetness of it, the happiness that the Lord can choose to be the one that will put this on record. But as you look at the contents of the things that will happen, the thunders and the devastations and the horrors and the deaths 
and the crimes of the people and the sorrow of the people, crying that the rock shall fall upon them. Then you understand the content is bitter. But the very fact that you are chosen to be the writer, that will be sweet, that will make you happy. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and etched it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. It's still telling us that you see John that is writing. But it's telling us that he's a companion of the brethren in tribulation. John, are you surprised? Are you bothered that now you are suffering persecution for the Lord Jesus Christ? John says, no, I'm not bothered. Go back to my gospel and you will see the prediction that persecution will come upon the believer. I've written that already a few years ago out of the words of Jesus Christ. And I know that heaven and earth may pass away, but the words of Jesus Christ will never go unfulfilled in John chapter 16. Verse 33, John chapter 16, verse 33. Here are the words of Jesus Christ telling his own disciples before he left that persecution was coming. Get ready. Persecution will be coming. Get ready. Get prepared. In John chapter 16, verse 33, it says, These, it says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. John wasn't surprised. He had written about that many, some years before. He said, in the world, ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That was the thing that gave them the assurance that although there will be persecution, although there will be pressure, although there will be all that physical suffering, ye can still be of good cheer. We can still be happy in the Lord. When Paul the Apostle came, and then the churches were being planted, he gave encouragement to the people that persecution will come. Tribulation and trials will come. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Reading from verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, we must, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Don't be surprised then if you are born again. And then you have entered into the kingdom of God in the spiritual realm of the kingdom. But then the final kingdom that is still to come, you are preparing so that you will enter into that kingdom to understand we must through more tribulation. As one is going, another one is coming. Because sinners are still in the world and they're the people that persecute. Because Satan is still in the world and he is the agent and the very source and the origin of the persecution. Because evil spirits that make people to do evil, there's still much around here in the world. And they are the people, they are the spirit that instigate people, move people, uh, stir up people to persecute the believers. Because the people that love darkness rather than light, they're still in the world and they're the people that will move others, they will motivate others, they will stir up other people to persecute the people that love the light and have gone out of darkness. If you have come into the light, if you have received the light of the gospel and you are walking according to the word of God, the people of this world, those who are still in darkness, they are going to persecute you because you are walking in the light. But then it says that persecution has something to do in our lives because maybe you are wondering yourself and you say, ah, but why should God allow the persecution? Why doesn't God just take the persecution away? Because the persecution has a purpose. Because the persecution is like the exercise that the little children have. If those uh, little children, if they don't have the exercise, their muscles will not be strengthened. Their bones will not be strong. And their intelligence will not be developed. It is the exercise. And all the things that come to them, that's the thing that strengthens them. Look at those trees that you see on the side of the road. The wind will blow. They will bend this way and bend that way. And then the sun will shine. And the storm will come upon them. It is the storm and the wind that strengthens those trees. And the roots go deep into the ground. It is the persecution. 
It is a trial. It is a suffering that makes the Christian strong and it makes your roots to go deep into Christ so that you are rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. There is a purpose, there is a reason why those persecutions are allowed. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, I'm reading to you from verse 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. We don't regret, we glory in tribulation. We don't murmur, we glory, we rejoice in tribulation. Why so? Why do we rejoice in tribulation? Because we know that tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience. And experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. That is, in the midst of that tribulation, in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that problem, we keep on rejoicing because it produces something good, something marvelous in our Christian lives. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, First Thessalonians chapter 3, we're reading from verse 8, Let that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. That is, when the Lord appointed our lives and appointed our Christian living and appointed the promises of God and appointed the ministry we're going to be involved with, he also appointed the suffering. He also appointed the tribulation. He also appointed the persecution. And he moderates everything. He limits everything. He doesn't allow any persecution, any suffering to go beyond what he has appointed. We are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it is, it came to pass and ye know for the cause when I could no longer forbear I sent to know your faith lest by some means the enemy, the tempter have tempted, uh, have tempted you and our labor be in vain. He said, let's become you begin to come to a wrong conclusion that if our leaders are suffering like that, if the apostles are suffering like that, if they are suffering persecution and tribulation, maybe something is wrong in their lives. No, the opposite is true because they are right with the Lord, because they have taken the ministry appointed unto them by the Lord. So the suffering appointed with that ministry is being fulfilled also in their lives. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're looking at verse 12. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, giving us the assurance that this tribulation is not peculiar to John. And it's not peculiar to the Christians of the first century. And it's not peculiar to Paul the apostle. He tells us, he says, yea, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Everyone that will suffer and uh, that will live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. The only way you can avoid the persecution is if you avoid godliness. If you avoid holiness. If you avoid taking a stand. If you avoid uh, taking an uncompromising stand. That's the only time you can avoid persecution. And if you avoid holiness, you avoid heaven. If you avoid godliness, you avoid heaven. Therefore, just stay there and understand that it is appointed. But nothing will come on you much more than what the Lord has appointed. He says the reason for that persecution is in verse 13. Verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They are deceived. Some of them even think that they are serving God by persecuting you. They belong to the wrong religion, but they think they are right, and they think they are going well. And there is no salvation being taught in their local assembly, in their churches where they go, and they feel that they are the only people of God. And when you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are living a righteous life, a godly life, those people that have, be, have deceived themselves, and others are still deceiving them, they will persecute you, thinking that you are wrong. And thinking that they are right. But it says in that persecution, there's something you have to do. It's in verse 14. It says, But continue, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. It says, Don't look at the persecution, don't look at the problem, just continue in the things that you have learned. And as he said that to you, uh, Timothy, he made himself an example. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. 
wherein I suffer trouble. He said, Timothy, what I'm telling you to do, I'm doing it also. What I tell you to endure, I'm enduring it too. What I tell you that you should continue, continue in the Lord, even though there's persecution, even though there's suffering, I'm doing it too because it says, wherein I myself, I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even unto bonds into imprisonment, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And then in verse, in verse 11, it says it's a faithful saying. For if we, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him if we suffer with him. We shall also reign with him if we deny him. He also will deny us. I pray you will not deny the Lord. Whatever comes your way, you'll keep on standing till the very end in Jesus' name. You remember what John has written. John has said there are three things. Number one, is I'm, I'm your companion in tribulation. Number two, I'm your companion in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom. When he said in the kingdom, what does that mean? And when did he come into that kingdom? And how can you be sure that you yourself, you are in the kingdom also, so that you will be one of those companions that, that uh, John is talking about? It tells us in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us to be meet, and me to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and the lights, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. How? How was that done? Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. When you came to the Lord, maybe last year, maybe five years ago, some many years ago, when you came to the Lord and you turned away from your sin and you repented from your sin and you said, Lord, forgive me. Turn me around. Change my life. I want to serve you till the rest of my life from now on. And then the Spirit of God bore witness in your heart that your sins were forgiven. That now he's giving you a new nature. And you're now serving the Lord. And there is no problem. There is, uh, there is no conflict between you and the Lord anymore. That the middle wall of partition that divided you from the Lord has been broken down because you repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. At that time, you were delivered out of the kingdom of darkness. And you were brought into the kingdom of his dear son. And this kingdom of God is not physical. It's not a meat and drink. It is something spiritual. And it comes with righteousness, purity, holiness in our lives. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It is righteousness and it is peace and it is joy in the Holy Ghost. And then in Revelation here is what it tells us in chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We're looking at it now because it says, I'm in this isle of the Patmos and I'm your companion number one. I'm your companion in tribulation. Number two, I am your companion in the kingdom, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Number three, I'm your companion in patience, the patience, the perseverance of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means I'm not in a hurry. That means, although the suffering is there, and I'm already 90 years of age, I'm not saying, oh, Jesus, when are you going to come? When will I die? So that I'll escape all these things. I'm patient in the tribulation. I'm persevering in the tribulation. In chapter 3 of Revelation, reading from verse 10 and verse 7, it says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which is to come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon, upon the earth. It says, what we're going through is nothing. When the great tribulation comes, that one is going to try, going to test, and going to really punish all the people of the earth. Therefore, we can go through the little, little things that come across our way now, because we're going to escape the great tribulation that is to come. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. We can suffer a little here so that we'll reign with the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. In Romans chapter 7, chapter 8, verse 17. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 17. And ye children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. I pray that the grace to remain steadfast and uncompromising until the Lord comes, he will give unto every one of us in Jesus' name. Because if we suffer with him here, we're going to reign with him in eternity. Now we go to point number two. Perception of Christ through the spirit of revelation. The perception of Christ through the spirit of revelation. It tells us in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet here john is telling us that even though he was undergoing persecution and even though the uh, the conditions uh, the situation was not convenient at all yet he says do you know this i was in the spirit on the lord's day that means the spirit of god took that how did that happen obviously he was not looking at things that are seen he was looking at things that are not seen actually he was not thinking of his condition and mourning and murmuring and complaining and saying oh god why has this come upon me obviously he was not regretting that was a christian he was still meditating on the word of the lord on the glory that shall come on all the words that christ has spoken to his own people before and as well, he was meditating then it was the day of the lord and he said well it's the day of the lord even though we cannot have music now even though i cannot have companions here now even though i cannot have other worshipers to be with me now even though i cannot be on the pulpit and be preaching now he started preaching to himself and he started meditating on the word of god on the lord's day that was a sunday because you see those early believers they knew that jesus rose on the first day of the week not only that he appeared to them many times by many infallible proofs on the first day of the week and then because of that the first day of the week the church will gather together to commemorate the resurrection of the lord jesus christ and to commemorate the redemption the recreation of the new creature that we have and because of that he had become so used to that that even though he was in the isle of patmos isolated from every other christian around he was still in the spirit in the spirit of worship in the spirit of the lord on the lord's day and while he was in the spirit he had the voice behind him and what does that mean in the spirit in the spirit it means that the spirit of god took over his life overpowered the flesh overpowered the physical surrounding and he just found himself open to only the things of the spirit of god that was not the only time he'll be in the spirit if you look at revelation chapter 4 Revelation chapter 4, reading from verse 2. It says, and immediately, I was in the spirit. What a wonderful thing. If you read the Acts of the Apostles, they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. And then when some challenges came upon their lives, the Holy Ghost will come upon them afresh again. And those of us who are children of God today, you have been saved, you have been sanctified, and you are filled with the Holy Ghost. There are times that the Spirit of God will just take over your life, and you are overwhelmed and overpowered again. And you are in looked again in the spirit of the lord here he tells us now again revelation chapter 4 verse 3 immediately i was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne in revelation chapter 21 revelation chapter 21 the experience of john john the beloved in being in the spirit revelation 21 verse 10 here he tells us in verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Do you see again there? He was carried away in the spirit. He was uh, in the spirit of God again. He says, Now he saw Jerusalem, new Jerusalem, descending from heaven above, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone very most precious even like a jasper stone and clear 
as crystal. Well, that was the kind of experience that Paul the Apostle had. If you turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you will see how he related his own experience when he too was carried away in the spirit of God. And he was in paradise, in the third heavens. And he saw things, mysteries of the kingdom of God. It looks like these people that suffered very much. They were the people that received the greatest revelation. Why is that so? It was an assurance from the Lord. Although you are suffering don't think you are suffering for nothing because you see the devil might come and say what if after all this suffering there is no heaven what if after all this suffering there is no future what if after all this heaven there is no there is no hell what if after all this suffering you die like an animal and you go nowhere and because they suffered so much and the lord wanted to assure them don't allow the devil to confuse you and say that what, what if there is no heaven what if there is no hell and so the lord transported them to the glories beyond, so that they saw what other eyes have not seen, what eyes have not seen, what ears have not heard, what has not been revealed to the heart of man. It was revealed to these people because they suffered so much. They needed comfort. They needed reassurance. They needed affirmation, confirmation that they were not suffering for nothing. That's why the Lord showed them the great revelations that he showed them. And that's why it's been written in the word of God. That you too can read the revelations and understand that if you are suffering, you are not suffering in vain. One of these days, the Lord will come and he will take you to heaven. And he will reward you for all the things that you have gone through. He will reward every one of us in Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, reading there from verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ. It is his way of writing. He didn't want to say, I myself. That's why it's writing in the third person singular. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows such an one caught up into the third heaven. What he's saying is, I don't know whether it is my whole body, soul, and spirit that was transported to heaven. Or whether my body was left down here and my spirit just went up above. That one I cannot tell. I was not even conscious about body or no body. All I know is I was transported and caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body again he says, or out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is unlawful it is not lawful for man to what i said i cannot even give you words that will paint the picture for you to understand but i saw those things and that encouraged him in his imprisonment in the spirit those people that were caught away out of their body and they saw what natural eyes could not see because they were totally in the spirit and they were overwhelmed and overpowered by the spirit of god was it only john was it only paul did it happen to all the people too that they were in the spirit and then what they saw in the spirit encouraged them strengthened them and they were able to stand and they stood till the end of time point to ezekiel to look at ezekiel chapter 3 Ezekiel chapter 3, look at it from verse 10. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all the words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with, thy, with thine ears, and go get thee to them of the captivity of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, thus says the Lord God, whether they, hear, they will hear, or whether they will forbear. Then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from this place. Hey, can you see? The, the same thing that happened to John had happened to Ezekiel before. And Ezekiel, and Ezekiel said, after the Lord has spoken to me, that whatever I reveal to you, you will reveal unto my people. Then he said, the spirit came up. The spirit uh, cu cut me up. And the spirit now revealed things that I didn't know before. In Ezekiel chapter 11. Ezekiel chapter 11, reading from verse 5. Being in the spirit, and the spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and said unto me, Speak, 
Thus says the Lord, Thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, every one of you, every one of them. It says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon me. And before that chapter ends, we read in verse 24, Afterwards, the Spirit took me up and brought me into a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea, to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. Then I speak unto them of the captivity, all the things that the Lord had showed me. You will see that these people, they enjoyed the revelation of the Spirit of God. And um, in First Peter chapter 4, First Peter chapter 4, when we're suffering persecution then, we should be expecting the glory of the Lord. We should be expecting the revelation of the Lord. If you're not thinking much about the persecution, if you're not meditating much about what you are going through, and all you're thinking about is the glory of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord, the grace of God, and uh, the appointment of the Lord, and the, the fact that he has limited the persecution, and the persecution is to do something good, something marvelous in your life. In First Peter chapter 4, verse 14, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory, and of God resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. That is when you are going through persecution. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. And don't be so sorrowful about it. Understand, if you will comport yourself in the right way at such a time, it's then the glory of the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in a mighty way. Second Corinthians chapter four, chapter four. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 16. For the which cause we faint not. Persecution, we faint not. Suffering, we faint not. The conflicts of the world, we faint not. All the pressures coming upon us. For this reason, we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet if the inward man is renewed day by day, isn't that what happened to John on the Isle of Patmos? Even though the persecution was there, even though the problems were there, he wasn't fainting, but his inward man was being renewed day by day. That's why I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And then he had the voice of the Lord like a trumpet that spoke behind him. Then he says in verse 17 here, our light affliction. That's our persecution, our light affliction. When you consider the persecution with the glory that shall come, you will know it's just a light affliction. All the things you are going through, if you, you know, that you are thinking oh, about this why is this happening why is that happening our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we look not at things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal in first corinthians chapter 2 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 10. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit. The things we could not know in the natural, God has revealed them to us by his spirit. John, the beloved, was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And when you come to church, whether it's Monday or on the Lord's day, on Sunday or it's Thursday, what a wonderful thing if you can be in the spirit. What a wonderful thing. If you lessen the physical and you exalt the spiritual, what a wonderful thing. If you don't look at things that are seen, but you look at things that are not seen. What a wonderful thing. You come to the house of the Lord on the Lord's day and you tune yourself, you readjust yourself so that you can be in the spirit. And the things of this world, the mundane things of life, will not be taking your attention while you are in the presence of the Lord. It is then that God will reveal to you by his spirit spirit for the spirit such as all things yea the deep things of god for what man knoweth the things of a man except save the spirit of man which is in him even so the things of god knoweth no man but the spirit of god now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of god that we might know the things which are that are freely given to us 
of God. And then he tells us in verse 13, which things also will speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. That is, if we come to church and we're just carnal and natural, and we are concentrating on the natural, on the physical, and we're not tuning ourselves to hear the voice of the Lord. And we're not in the spirit, even though we're in the house of God, even though it is a Lord's day. Then we will not recognize the things of the spirit, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. On the first day of the week, that is the Lord's day. And you will see that, I'm sure you know this already, but let's just refer to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, reading in verse 7. The early church met on the first day of the week. They worshipped on the first day of the week, and that became the Lord's day. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, that's the Lord's day, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. And he continued his speech until midnight. Did you hear that? I said, did you hear that? He continued the speech until aren't you grateful that I don't continue till midnight? In Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, I'm reading from, to you from verse 10. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Here John is relating his experience and he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. I heard behind me a great voice. And that voice sounded like a trumpet. That's the voice of the Almighty. The voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The voice of Alpha and Omega. The voice of the one that was dead and is risen again and is alive forevermore. And his voice was not like when he was walking the streets of Jericho, when he was in Jerusalem in his earthly ministry. His voice was now sounding like that of a trumpet. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. After this I looked and behold the door was opened in heaven. And the, vo and the first voice which I had was a seat were a trumpet. A seat were a trumpet saying, talking, talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. As you look at John the beloved, uh, he perceived the things of the spirit of God as was in the spirit on the Lord's day. His physical senses were suspended and his spirit became open to the visions and revelation of the spirit of God. The revelation concerning the day of the Lord. That is concerning the end time. Concerning the beginning of the great tribulation all through to the end of the millennial kingdom. All that was revealed to him while he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Then he was commanded to write down the revelation and to send it to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Uh, we have understood now that persecution or pain or suffering or hardship will not hinder, cannot hinder a God-ordained ministry. And sometimes as you are in the ministry and then there's persecution or maybe there is pain, then you are wondering, this persecution will it will crush my ministry, will destroy my ministry. No, it never happens like that. No matter where a man is, no matter how hard his life may be, and no matter what he is passing through, he may, be, he may still be in the spirit whenever he gives himself fully, consecrates himself fully unto the Lord. And if he is in the spirit, even on Patmos, the glory and the message of God will come to him and will come through him to all the people. Now I want to see point number three the preeminence of Christ in the revelation the preeminence of Christ in the revelation revelation chapter 1 we're looking at verse 11 revelation chapter 1 verse 11 saying I am alpha and omega the first and the last I am alpha and omega the first and the last and you know that almighty God himself that is God the father had said this before and yet Jesus Christ is saying the same thing, which means that the same attributes that God the Father has, this, that same attribute Jesus the Son of God has. I and my Father are one. Here is Jesus Christ saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Turn back to verse 8. 
Here is Almighty God talking. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. That means then the Almighty God and Jesus Christ, they have the same attributes. As you look at verse 17, the words of Jesus Christ, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. So then as you think about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is also God. Because here we have the attributes of mighty God related to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In chapter 2 verse 8. Chapter 2 of Revelation verse 8. It says, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things, says he, says the first and the last, which was, which was dead, and is alive. Is in talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, you will see how is uh, the Lord is um, present and preeminent in this book of the Revelation. And glory, worship, majesty, everything was given and ascribed unto Him. In chapter five of Revelation, from verse two, Revelation chapter five, verse two, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, "Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof?" And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed at, to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, the living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. This referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, as it had been slain, having seven hearts. That's the fullness of power, the fullness of ability. And then seven eyes. That's the fullness of knowledge, of insight, penetrating into all the hearts of men and women, which are the seven spirits of God. That's the Holy Ghost in his fullness and power, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book, out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And then he tells us in verse 11, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and, uh, and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them had I seen blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And you will see the glory of the Lamb, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, how preeminent he, he was. He became, as you think about all the happenings and all the revelations you have in this book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19, the preeminence of Christ in this book is, is in the book through and through. Uh, just these verses to show you how preeminent the Lord Jesus Christ is as you read through the book. Chapter 19, verse 16. And he has on his vesture and on his time a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Chapter 21, verse 6. Revelation chapter 21, 
verse 6. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that's the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. As you uh, look at uh, the book of Revelation, you find that Jesus Christ equal with the Father. The same with the Father. That he is, uh, I mean, the same nature. Omnipotent as the Father, omnipresent as the Father, omniscient as the Father, and eternal, eternally existent as the Father. He's referring to himself as the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Revelation chapter 22, reading from verse 12 to verse 13. It says, Behold, I come quickly. This is Jesus Christ. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This is the Lord Jesus that gave the revelation. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. And let's come back to Revelation chapter 1. As you look at Revelation chapter 1, you see what the Lord is commanding John in verse 11. Saying, chapter 1 verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, and unto Pagamos, and unto Tatyra, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. If you look at verse 19, you will see that same command. He was writing. Write the things which thou hast seen. That's part one. And the things which are. That's part two. And the things which shall be hereafter. That is part three. Things who are seen now. The vision of Jesus Christ. And the things that are. All the conditions of the churches present at this time. And the things that shall be. After the church has been raptured away. And the great tribulation will be on the earth. Write everything. In chapter 14 of Revelation. The commandment of the Lord to John again. Chapter 14 of Revelation, reading from verse 13. It says, And I had a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, says the Lord, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his right hand a sharp sickle. He was to write everything down. For the encouragement of the the believers for the encouragement believers that were suffering persecution write everything down and send it to the churches revelation chapter 19 verse 9 he had seen the marriage supper of the lamp now and after seeing the marriage supper of the lamp he was told again write it down write it down i go back to verse 5 revelation chapter 19 verse 5 and a voice came out of the throne saying Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife, the bride, has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be a Red in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Write now. For the encouragement of the believers, write it. For the encouragement of those who are suffering and they are wondering, ah, Why am I suffering like this? What's the purpose of suffering like this? Suffer now for Christ, and then you'll reign with Christ eternally. Write it down for them. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true saints of God. We come to Revelation chapter 21. Chapter 21, reading from verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he says unto me, John, you have not finished your duty yet. Write it down again. Do you see the commandment of the Lord? When the Lord has given you revelation, 
Then he wants you to publish it. He has given you understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He wants you to publish it for the encouragement of the believers that might be going through some problems and for the encouragement of the believers, the sinners that are not born again so that they will see the glory that awaits the believers and they will want to come into the kingdom of God. It says in that verse 5, right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of what of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I, I pray you will overcome. Because it is as we overcome. The reason we are studying all this is for encouragement. That the glory that is to come. Reigning with Christ. And then all the blessings we are going to receive. Should be for encouragement. That whatever we are going through today. We we'll say this means nothing. It's just light affliction. Whatever I am going through. The glory that is to come. That's what I am waiting for. And it is when we overcome. We will be able to inherit all things. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he shall be my son. What if because of the persecution it becomes fearful and timid and it's not able to move on with the Lord but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the mongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. The Lord is encouraging us. He's saying that if we endure till the end there is reward. If we endure till the end we're going to reign with the Lord. The great voice sounding like a trumpet was the voice of Christ, the exalted, glorified Christ. John heard that voice before he saw him. The one who spoke then identified himself as the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And then the speaker, who is to reveal and ex execute the divine plan, is the eternal Christ himself as the Alpha and the Omega. All of the words of wisdom and revelation from him are in him. Because he is the alpha. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. And he's the omega. That's the last letter of the Greek alphabet. That means then all the letters and all the words in between. They belong to him. And the revelation of all mysteries from God comes through Jesus Christ. He is the sum total. The embodiment of the words and the wisdom. And the self-disclosure of the invisible God. Christ is everywhere present in this book, is everywhere prominent in this book. Not only present and prominent, I've read the references to you already, he is preeminent, he is exalted above everyone else, above angels and men, above the living creatures and above the 24 elders, above everyone because we see them throwing down their crowns and then bowing down before him, worshipping him. In this book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is exalted high. He is preeminent. This book of Revelation then reveals the exaltation, the power, the dominion, the authority, the enthronement of Christ. Angels and men worship him. They worship the preeminent Christ. And then John was commanded, write it down, reveal it. All that you have seen, send it to the churches. When Daniel received his own revelations of the end time events, he was commanded to seal up the book, even to the time of the end. But John was commanded, don't seal it up. Don't wrap it up. Don't bury it. Write it down. Send this revelation to God's people. The mystery was sealed at the time of Daniel. It is now an open vision in the time of John the Beloved. When the Lord has given you, revealed himself to you in salvation, revealed himself to you in sanctification and holiness, revealed himself to you in the power of the Spirit, you are to then reveal that same truth unto all the people so that what you have seen, what you have enjoyed. All the people too. They'll be able to see. They'll be able to receive. They'll believe and they'll enjoy as well. Remember what the Lord has taught us today. I, John, who also am your companion and your brother in tribulation and in the kingdom and in the patience of Jesus Christ. I was in the island, the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the churches which are in Asia. 
The Lord has revealed himself to you today. Are you just going to go out without doing something about it? Wouldn't you allow this revelation of the word to have an impact upon your life? So that the commandment of the Lord you'll be able to carry out. As John obeyed the Lord, you too, you'll have the grace to obey the Lord. Let's stop and begin to pray. Are you in the spirit or in the flesh? During the study, are you in the spirit or in the flesh? When you are going through persecution, do you stay in the flesh or you come into the spirit? Have you been persecuted for your faith? Have you been persecuted for your stand? Have you been persecuted for being saved, for living a righteous life? That to refuse to bow the knee to the kings of this world and to the idols of this world. And you refuse to bow the knee for the invitation to the invitation of the people of the world. And you are taking your stand. Or during the persecution and during the problems and during the things that come upon you. Then you come in the flesh. And you are not able to receive the revelation of the Lord. Why don't you tell the Lord, the Lord will give you the grace. That during your persecution, during your suffering, during the pain, whatever affliction or whatever may be the trial of faith coming upon your life, you'll not be thinking in the flesh, you'll not be acting in the flesh, you'll not be behaving in the flesh, you will be in the spirit. In the spirit. And during that time of persecution in the spirit, the Lord will be able to reveal himself more and more unto you. John was born again. He had known the Lord. And he bore record to that. What it means to be born again. What it means to know the Lord. Are you born again like John was born again? John had been sanctified. The Lord Jesus prayed for John. And the Adamic nature was taken away. He received that purifying of the identification of his spirit. And was fully consecrated and committed to the Lord until the very end of his life. Persecution, yes. Suffering, yes. Pain, yes. Affliction, yes. Opposition of the enemies, yes. Hatred of unbelievers, yes. But he remained through it all. Through it all. He remained with the Lord. How about you? How about you? Are you remaining with the Lord? Are you remaining with the Lord? In the midst of the suffering. Remain with the Lord. Whatever the suffering, whatever the persecution. Remain with the Lord. Don't allow the persecution, the suffering, or the pain. You can still be in the spirit. 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 Stay there. Pray, the Lord will strengthen you. The Lord will help you.
Bahia. If you don't pray, the study will not be of any benefit to you. People like John, the beloved, the reason the Lord revealed himself to them because of their seriousness, their consecration and commitment. Give yourself fully to them. Take the word of God seriously. And even if you are suffering persecution because of the word, take your stand. Be in the spirit. The revelation of the Lord will be abundant to you. And then obey the Lord. What you have received, what you have learned at the Bible study, go and reveal it to other people so that they too can be saved as you are saved.